할렐루야 
우리 다시 오실 때까지 나 
잤더니 어, 자기 남편 얘기 붙였다고 해요. 그래서 제가 물어봤습니다. 아니, 자기 남편이 부친인지도 알지도 못하고 정확하게 장소를 알지 못하고 언제 마지막으로 이 저기 묘지를 방문했냐 이렇게 물어봤더니 자기 남편을 15년 전에 묻었는데 15년 전에 묻고 처음으로 방문한 거예요. 아, 저기 몽골 사람들의 그 장례 문화가 다른 것을 알 수가 있습니다. 한번 묻으면 끝이에요. <웃음> 근데 몽골에는 무슨 뭐 조상한테 뭐 제사를 빈다든가 그런 게 없습니다. 그래서 저는 이 몽골 사람들의 어떤 그런 그 문화 속에는 그 운명론적인, 그 다음에 숙명론적인 그런 그 사고방식을 삼고 있습니다. 아마 남아불교의 그 영향을 받은 것 같아요. 이 사람들이 또 이렇게 인사를 할 때, 우리 최재 목사님이 그 바스카 우리 교회 지절 좋아하는 이유가 뭐냐면 이 사람들은 인사할 때 나이 든 사람이 젊은 사람 마음을 이렇게 잡고 그 다음에 이렇게 냄새를 마십니다. 우리가 좀 이따 예배 끝나고 나서 한번 그렇게 한번 <웃음> 깊이 상대방을 깊이 빠지는 그런 인사를 할수 있습니다. 그리고 그 조카의 그 묘비는 묘비를 만들지 않고 빨간 십자가를 갖다 가서 딱 해서 십자가에 무슨 페인트를 칠하면 좋겠냐 그러고 들어가서 빨간 걸 치자 몽골 사람들은 빨간 걸 치라고 하거든요 빨간 십자가 공동묘지가 있는데 유일하게 거기에 십자가 빨간 십자가 이렇게 있습니다 저는 몽골에 가서 성교 지향적인 하나님의 교를 사는 것이 하나님이 나에게 주신 비전이여 수명이라고 생각했습니다 그래서 그 비전과 수명을 붙잡고 하나님의 불신에 사명에 충실을 하고 헌신했습니다. 그래서 제가 오기 전에 하나님 앞에 울부짖는 기도가 있어요. 아 이제 한 1년 남, 남짓하니까 아, 도저히 몽골에 있고 싶지 않더라고요. Father, let me finish! Let me finish! 하나님도 몇 번씩 하나님 앞에 마치 해달라고. 그랬더니 하나님께서 마치로 할수 있도록 인도를 해주셨습니다. 입을 열어서 주님의 복음을 전파하면 몽골 형제들이 마음을 열고 복음을 줬습니다. 입을 열어서 어, 이게 참 성경적인 것 같아요. 침례를 준 장소에는 반드시 하나님의 교회가 생겼습니다. 침례를 너희는 가서 모든 제자를 잡고 아버지 아들과 성령을 침대를 주라고 했잖아요. 하나님께서 응답하셔서 침대를 준 데는 반드시 하나님의 교회가 서있습니다. 조카의 얘기를 다시 한번 하려고 합니다. 조카는 내가 2006년도에 이제 다라이라고 하는 데서 일들로 주말마다 차를 몰고 왔다 갔다 하면서 만난 우리 교회 지도 중에 하나입니다. 2006년 12월쯤 됐을 때 아주 추운 겨울입니다. 그리고 예배가 끝나고 나면 다랑으로 빨리 들어가야지 오랫동안 이리틴에 지칠 수가 없어요. 왜냐하면 해가 빨리 떨어지기 때문에 또 밤에 어, 겨울에 특별히 운전하는 게 굉장히 어렵습니다. 그래서 예배가 다 끝나고 축도 끝나고 어, 이렇게 인사를 하는데 빈바라고 하는 한, 어, 한 50이 채안된 젊은 사람이 들어왔어요. 젊은 사람이 들어오니까. 들어왔습니다. 그래서 한 얘기가 뭐냐면, 아주 유명한 사람이 한 사람 왔다는 얘기를 듣는데, 아마 제가 무슨 영화 중이나 무당처럼 생각했던 것 같아요. 예술을 믿는, 유명, 영화된 사람이 한 사람 왔다는데, 당신이구나. 지금 내 아내가 아파했으니까 와서 기도 좀 해달라고 하더라고요. 근데 저는 뭐 마음이 급하니까 자꾸 시키려고. 근데 아픈데 기도 달라고 부탁하는데 안갈 수가 없잖아요. 그래서 갔습니다. 몽골 국립대학 분교가 그 일대인데 그 국립대학 바로 뒤에 있는 게르라고 하는 그 데서 살고 있었거든요. 거기 들어갔습니다. 근데 제가 가면 물어봤어요. 얼마나 아픈 날 했더니 지난 6개월 동안 침대에 누워가지고 한 번도 일어난 적이 없대요. 
그리고 너무 아파가지고 계속 눈물을 흘리면서 침대에 누워있는데 당신이 와서 좀 기도 좀 해달라 아 이거 겁나더라고 아무리 용한 것에도 그렇지 이길 동안 침대에 산물도 안 일어났는데 그래서 들어갔습니다 제가 또뭐 어, 몽골을 배운 지가 한 2년 뿐이 안 돼가지고 그게 언어가 뛰어나지 못했어요 뭐, 뭐 뉴욕 액센트도 있고 뭐 영어 액센트도 있고 뭐 충청도 액센트도 있고 이런 것처럼 제가 어, 그래서 기대해달라고 해서 어떻게 기도를 했어요 몽골로 했는데 근데 딱안 했는데 별로 기분이 안 좋아요 그래서 이렇게 뒤를 보니까 어 달라이라마가 나를 딱 쳐다보니까 <웃음> 달라이라마 달라이라마만 쳐다보는 게 아니고 그것도 옆에 그 조그만 이상들은 그 조그만 불상을 저기 집에 이렇게 모시고 있거든요. 불상들이 또 나를 딱 쳐다보고 있는 거예요. 아, 그래도 뭐 기도를 해야 되니까 손을 놓고 기도를 했습니다. 6천 무말로 기도를 했는데 나중에 듣고 보니까 아무것도 못 알아들었대. 근데 한 가지는 안 알아들었대. 한 가지. 예수씨 때문에. 예수를 믿으세요. 저도 기도하면서도 야, 야, 좀뭐 그렇더라고요. 확실한 거. 그다음에 예수님들하고 약한세번 정도 강하게 기도했어요. 기도 끝나고 나서 어, 하나님 기도 응답하셨어요. 나섰어. 나섰어. 아, 이사님한테 필요한 게 예수 그리스도. 이게 어? 예, 우리 초카하고. 이게 달라라마하고 사자랑이 누르게 마주두게 돼 있었어요. 불쌍하고 마주두게 돼 있었어요. 몽골 사람한테 필요한 거는 예수 크리스도구나. 예수 크리스도구나. 제가 지난 17년 동안 사역을 하면서 제 마음을 사로잡은 하나님의 말씀이 있습니다. 사도행전 20장 24절, 20장 28절인데 내가 달려갈 때가 주 예수께 받은 사명 곧 하나님의 은혜의 복음을 증하는 일을 마치는 하면은 나의 생명조차 귀한 것으로 여기지 않아. 그 다음에 28절에 여러분은 자기를 위하여 또는 용량들을 위하여 쓴다라. 성령이 그들 가운데 여러분을 감독자로 삼고 하나님의 자기 피로 사신 교회를 보살피게 하셨습니다. 제가 지난 17년 사역하면서 우리 몽골 형제들한테 하나님의 교회가 참 중요해. 하나님의 교회가 참 중요해. 뭐 하루도 빠지지 않고 반복했던 것 같아요. God's church is the most precious to us. 그래서 우리 지자들은 알아요. 자기 와이프보다 미안하긴 하지만 제 와이프 굉장히 아름답지 않습니까? 와이프보다 귀찮게 <웃음> 하나님 귀에다 우리 커케이션 브라더한테는 좀 이해가 잘안 가르치는 거지만 It is! 왜냐면 하나님이 자기 피로 사신 교회를 보살피게 하십니다 2016년도 갔을 때 초카 장례식을 치웠다 그랬어요 2006년도에 예수를 믿고 초카가 하나님 앞에 헌신했습니다 그래서 우리가 안식이 끝나고 왔을 때 2008년대에 철하라고 하는 데 와서 하나님의 교회를 킨천했어요근데 2016년대에 우리가 갔을 때는 이게 암이 전이가 돼가지고 이게 도저히 불가능한 거예요. 그래서 병원에서 죽을 날을 기다리고 있었습니다. 근데 몽골에서는 해마다 교회를 연장을 해야 돼요. 얼마나 공급성도 그렇다. 근데 죽을 날이 몇달안 남았는데 병원에서 일어나가지고 몰래 빠져나가서 12명의 그 커뮤니 멤버 앞에 섰습니다. 와짝 만났죠. 그러면서 교회가 연장이 되어야 된다고 지금 이야기하고 있습니다. 그러니까 이유를 설명하라 했어요. 그분이. 왜 교회가 연장이 돼야 돼? 그랬더니 내가 그것이 얼마나 중요하면 내가 지금 몇달안 있는 죽을 그런 상황인데 그걸 무릅쓰고 당신들 앞에서 이렇게 광고하지 않아요. 그래가지고 보통 1년 주는데 3년을 받았어. 그러고 나서 원물에 가보니까 이게 벌써 병이 중해져가지고 얼마 살것 같지 않다. 
근데 그 조카가 한 번은 자기가 황금 바구니를 들고 하나님 앞에 기도하겠다. 바짝 말랐죠. 말도 제대로 못해. 서지도 못해. 다다다다. 떨면서 황금 바구니를 들고 하나님 앞에 기도합니다. 하나님, 저를 하나님 앞에 드립니다. 그리고 가장 귀한 황금 하나님 앞에 드립니다. 일어나서 몇 주위에 하나나 갔습니다. 우리 몽골 지자들이 어떤 면에서는 우리 성교사들보다 더 훨씬 있어요. 훨씬 많기 때문에 몽골의 이곳저곳에 하나님의 교회가 지금 세워지고 있습니다. 조카는 자기의 마지막 남은 생명까지도 하나님께 드리고 가는 것입니다. 한 번에 제가 설교를 했습니다. 우리가 가지고 있는 모든 것은 하나님 것이다. 나다도 내가 복해 먹으라니. 아, 그랬더니, 자기가 가지고 있는 집, 개를 하고, 자기가 가지고 있는 동물, 전부 다 하나님을 갖고 왔어요. 하나님 나라 확장을 위해서 피해를 써주세요. 다 들었어요. 성령님께서 이들을 일꾼 삼으시고, 이들로 하여금 일하게 하셨습니다. 그래서, 러시아 북쪽에도 이번에 탈북자들이 러시아 북쪽에 들어오다가 다 잡혔어요. 네 명이 잡혔어요. 하나님 뭐 굶어 죽었다고 하는 얘기도 있어요. 중국 북쪽에도 만주로 하면 동쪽 힌트에도 서쪽 카자흐스 하면 아래 하면에도 하나님의 교회를 이렇게 잡혔어요. 저는 이를 위해서 CMA 성교소로 하나님께 저를 사용하시는 데 대해서 얼마나 감사하고 그들은 마땅히 해야 할 일을 하고 왔어요. 그건 뭐 후회라는 데도 좀 없어요. 뭐 남이 안 해준다 하는데 그것도 좀 별로 크게 다한 적이 안 돼요. 근데 이렇게 좀 오프닝 그 예배 저기 말씀 하나님 집에 가실 때 가능하실 때 우리 백하이 목사님이 세우실 때 감사합니다. 뭐라 하나. 저는 CMA 신에서 갔습니다. CMA. 우리는 미션 부문이죠. 제 우리 아들 미션 부문이죠. 우리 아들 미션을 철치 텐팅 부문이죠. 제가 몽골에 가서 CMA 성교서로 우리는 성교 지향적인 교회를 개최한 것이 우리 모습입니다. 이게 대사업 교회인데 그리고 우리 아들 무모 더 지지해서 그러시죠. 몽골에서 처음으로 번역한 시가 하나 있습니다. 그게 뭐냐면, ABC 유지 목사님이 항상 프로클라메이션 지저스 오니. 그걸 몽골말로 번역을 했어요. 그래서 우리 몽골 지저스 다 나왔습니다. 우리가 또 크리스토 센트리 미션 부모지. 이번에 50명의 신창 소비자들이 이제 파손됩니다. 원래 60명이 가야 되는데, 아마 성경국이 좀 모자라게 들은 것 같아요. 우리 최성교사님하고 이제 장성교사님도 같이 갑니다. 이 우리 CNN 미션 모먼트는 Very Expensive Mission Project. 최소한 50명을 파손하려면 적게는 한 200만 원 돼서 많게는 300만 원 이상 들어가는 그런 아주 비싼 성지. 지난 87년부터, 1887년부터 우리가 복음을 증거해서 전 세계에 2만 6천 개 이상의 교회가 세워졌고, 지금 현재 600만 명 이상이 우리 CMA 교회의 멤버십을 갖고 있습니다. 그게 바로 우리의 DNA입니다. 이제 우리가 그 마지막 그첫 번째 기회, 1등, 우리 조혜명 목사님도 오셔가지고 잘 아세요. 같이 동의를 했기 때문에. 1등에서 그 기회 기초사를 하다가, 한 번에 이제 차를 몰고 이제, 이제, 다락으로 들어갑니다. 들어가는데, 그때 같이 왔던 우리 그 어른아라고, 다락에 있는 그 종기하고 교육 책임자예요. 어른아, 와들지 프레이. 잘 되라고 멋있게 얘기를 했어요. 
아, 자기 예수님께 성질 뿐이 안 돼가지고, 기도를 못 하겠대. 그럼 뭐, 내가, 나를 따라서 해라. 해가지고, 어? 예수님의 한나라는 것, 예수님을 지켜주세요. 그러나서, 30분 후에, 사고 났어. 제가 자고 있는 그, 레인프리저이 레인프리저는 차가 굉장히 무겁습니다. 6천 파운드가 넘어가는 아주 그냥 고릴라 같은 그런 차. 그게, 옆에 있는, 그, 리버 레인 프리저 폴이 있는데, 그걸 치고서는 차가 불렀어. 근데 그차 안에 8명이 타고 있었습니다. 제 여동생 딸도 있었고, 그 다음에 저희 딸도 있었고, 한달마도 있었고, 인쾌도 있어. 아, 순간적으로 이게 죽는구나. 아, 그런데, 아, 이게 뭘까? 제가 딱 했는데, 아, 돌이 뒤에 굉장히 많은데, 돌 가운데 딱 떨어졌어. 차는 완전히 돌아다는데, 한 사람도 다치지 않았어. 성경은 굉장히 리스키한 거지. 특별히 프론트에서 성경은 무슨 리스키한 거지. 여러분 차가 느껴지는 경우인데 기차하고 부딪 거의 아니 아마 0.5초만 늦었으면 부딪혔을 거예요. 왜냐면 그 기차 운전사하고 우리 아버지 딱 맞죠. 아, 아니 또 우리 딸의 그 기억 속에는 그 자동차 사고가 추앙하고 지금 아마 있습니다. 또 지난 아, 몇 개월 전에 자동차 사고 났던 곳에 가서. 나무들이 흔적들이 하여튼 나와있더라고 12년 전에 있던 사람들이 그래서 그걸 부속을 모았습니다 도요다라고 그렇게 된게 무슨 플라스틱도 있더라고 모았어요 그걸 보면서 하나님이 얼마나 나를 지켜주신다 기억하기 위해서 여러 가지의 어려움이 많았어요 그러나 그 어려움에 불구하고 하나님의 교회가 세워진다고 하는 그 기쁨하고는 비교될 것이 없었어요 3년 4번에 3번 내지 4번에 죽음의 국가 고비를 남겼습니다. 그런 사이에 하나님에게는 하나씩 둘째 붙여졌습니다. 그리고 크게 사고가 났던 거기는 이제 작년에 교회가 하나 더 개척해서 북쪽과 남쪽을 나누면서 지금 예배를 보고 있습니다. 교회를 개척할 수 있도록 하나님께서 사명 주시고 기회 주시고 어려울 때마다 하나님께서 지켜주시는 것 얼마나 감사하고 하나님께 아버지께 영광과 감사를 드리겠습니다. 주님 오시는 그날까지 성교지향적인 교회를 개최한 교회 개최 운동을 계속될 것입니다. 제가 이제 은퇴하고 간다니까 동료들이 물었더라고요. 은퇴하면 뭐 할래? 그래서 내가 I'm going to change my tire. We tire. 일부 <웃음> Four season tire. <웃음> I'll be more active. <웃음> 그래서 하는 얘기 뭐냐면, If I'm in Long Island, I plant a church in Long Island. If I'm in Queens, I plant a church in Queens. If I'm in Korea, I plant a church in Korea. If God opens the door for North Korea, then I will plant a church in North Korea. We s h a l l church in Plenty m o m e n t should continue. 그러면 어떻게 미셸 처치 팬디 모먼트에 우리가 참여할 것인가 기대를 잠깐 보고 마치도록 하겠습니다. 조카입니다. 조카 하나님의 기회를 얼마나 살수있는지 몰라요. 때만 되면은 여러분 그 밀크 중에서도 고트 밀크가 가장 맛있고 비쌉니다. 성도들이 오면요. 그 염수젓을 짜가지고 온 성대한테 한 명씩 나눠줘요. 이야. 그래서 제가 곧 밀크 미션. 너무 <웃음> 비상해볼 <웃음> 만한. 근데 하나를 갈 때는 가장 많았어. 그래가지고 한 몇주 시간 내내 하나를 갔습니다. 어, 이게, <웃음> 이게 무슨 사진인가 할까요? 이 미션 컨퍼런스를 제가 1997년대 저희 집 응접실에서 했습니다. 응급실에서. 그때 당시 교회를 개최하고, 한 시간에 179씩 
그 렌트를 냈어요. 세 시간 이상을 쓸수 없겠더라고. 너무 비싸고, 또 장소가 허락하지 않아가지고, 우리 집에서 했습니다. 이렇게 보면 뭐, 아이고, 그랬어. 아, 뭐 했네. 근데 보세요. 이 미션 컨퍼런스를 통해서 저와 제 부부가 몽골로 갔습니다. 나 이거 보면, 저기, 제 여동생은 안 나오는데, 여동생 부부는 몽골에 왔던 수십만 불 정도 허물을 했어요. 금액을 얘기하면 또 깍둥 놀랄까봐 저기 얘기를 안 합니다. 그 다음에 그리고 또 남동생은 예당기원도? 예열기원도. 어, 거기서 가장 신시하다. 동생이 잘 알았으면 이제 안 하지만 가장 신시하다. 안수십세가 하나 본사 대상으로. 어, 성료를 위해서 가장 훨신된 부부 중에 하나입니다. 그 다음에 여기 우리 어머니니까 아버지는 안 보이는데 아버지는 지금까지 저한테 지시를 드립니다. 네, 보고 계시죠. 아, 역시 아버지가 좋더라고요. 하나님 아버지 좋으시지. 우야다 미션 부부. 제가 성교사를 준비하네. 우야다 미션 부부. 우리 김재현 선생님 오셔가지고 집에서 이렇게 포대하고 사놓고 성교했습니다. 아, 참 힘들었을 때, 몇 사람 앉아놓고 했을 때. 근데, 저 미션 컨퍼런스 중에서 다 오셔서 우리는 성교사를 가든지 아니면 성교사를 보내는 기회가 됩니다. 이제 저는 아, 몽골을 떠났습니다. 우리 최재원 성교사 목을 창원지에 앉아 있습니다. 이제 여러분들한테 최재원 목사님과 창원님을 미신 부모가 계속 되십니다. 기도해 주시고 그리고 잊지 마시고 꼭 헌금도 해 주시길 부탁드립니다. <웃음> 저한테 보내는 분들은 저쪽으로 오시면 됩니다. <웃음> 감사합니다. 
아이들 우리 그 탈의 스미스 목사님 통해서 하나님께서 우리들에게 주시는 말씀 잘하는 시간인데요. 어, 이 통역이 필요하신 분들은 이 화면에 전화번호 나갑니다. 그, 그 전화번호로 전화하시고 어, 액세스 코드를 입력하시면 아, 전화로 전화 오시면 되는 거예요. 그래서 통역을 들으실 수가 있습니다. 그래서 우리 탈의 목사님 어, 자작년에 처음 그 통역 교수 부총리 대시 되셨을 때 감독회에서 만나서 좀 우리 한일총회 오셔서 말씀 좀 전해달라 그랬더니 올해 처음으로 디스트리트 오시게 됐어요. 그래서 it is such an honor, uh, you know, uh, hear the God's word uh, through you. Okay, would you move forward? Good evening, everyone. Uh, again, good evening, everyone. There, it's working. <laughs> it is a special privilege uh, to be with you. Thanks so much, Host Church, for feeding us well and leading us well in uh, worship tonight. Uh, it's so good to be in the uh, presence of the Lord. I've known your district superintendent for a number of years. We met at a coach's training uh, years ago back in uh, Atlanta, and uh, our friendship has grown from that time until this. Always good to be with my good friend, Pastor David Yoon, as well, who serves on our Alliance Board of Directors. And so good uh, to be with uh, all of you uh, this week. So always a sacred privilege to share God's Word and a special privilege to share God's Word with you uh, tonight. Would you pray with me? And let's ask the Lord to speak to us in these moments. Father, we come in the mighty name of Jesus, that name in whom is all authority and all power. We bow our knee. We open our hearts. We open our ears and we say, speak to us, Lord Jesus. Through the voice of your Holy Spirit, through your written word, would you prompt us as to what we need to do, which direction we need to go, as we seek to live for you and serve you in this world. Hide this preacher behind the cross of Jesus Christ. May Jesus and Jesus only be exalted. It's in His name that we pray. Amen. 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 I wonder if we were to go out onto the sidewalks and subways of New York City this evening and uh, ask this question, who do you believe Jesus to be? What kind of responses would we get? And I suspect that we would get every imaginable kind of response, not simply because we're in New York City, because I don't suspect that the results would be any different any place else. But some would say he's just a myth who never really existed, something like the gods of the Greek pantheon. Others would mock Jesus and those who believe in him as an intolerant force for evil in our world. One of those religious people who is really the source of all the world's problems, they would say. Others would see Jesus as a historical figure, as a, a prophet or a good teacher, a good example, but nothing more than that. But what we celebrated yesterday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, declares loudly and clearly that He is much different and much greater than any of those opinions. There is no one like Him. Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 2.9 says that God gave Him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's coming a day when everyone, no matter their opinion right now, will understand and acknowledge who Jesus is, that He is uniquely Lord. 
decades ago, Bill Gaither wrote these words, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. And yes, there is something about that name. There is no name like Jesus. So tonight, I want to take us to Acts chapter 4, verses 8 to 13, as we think of that name, Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verses 8 to 13. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now the context of these verses will be very important to us as we go along this evening. You'll remember at the beginning of Acts chapter 3, uh, Peter and John had encountered a man who had been lame from birth and was seated at the entrance of the temple to beg for his daily sustenance. And, and Peter had said to him, silver and gold I do not have, but what I, give you, what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And immediately and miraculously, this man was healed. Not only did he walk, but it says he was walking and jumping and praising God. And a crowd gathered so that Peter was able to preach the gospel. And a couple of thousand people, if you do the math, uh, came to believe in Jesus Christ. But the religious leaders weren't so happy. And they arrested Peter and John. And the words that we read here from Acts chapter 4 are part of Peter and John's bold defense before these unbelieving Jewish religious leaders. They had healed this man in the name of Jesus. And now they did not back down one bit in declaring that name of Jesus in this unfavorable and even hostile environment. So central to what they are declaring and what we want to see tonight is that Jesus is the only Savior. In John 14, 6, Jesus had made this declaration about Himself. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. So Jesus was declaring... Not that he was a way to the Father, or one element of truth, or one out of the, uh, a few sources of life. No, he is the way, the truth, and the life. What, what Peter is saying here in verse 12 is an echo of that same declaration. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus is uniquely the way to and the source of salvation. His name is the only name through which salvation and eternal life can be obtained. So how can Jesus make that claim about himself? And how can Peter now make that claim about Jesus? Well, the preceding verses before verse 12... Uh, give us the answer. First we see that only Jesus died for our sins. As Peter declared to these religious leaders in verse 10, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. And as 
much as these religious leaders crucified Jesus, it could be said that we too crucified Jesus. And in something of the gospel, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says in verse 3 that Christ died for our sins. Now there have been a lot of religious martyrs down through the years. Even a lot of Christian martyrs down through the years. But of only Jesus can it be said He died for our sins. People have died because of their own sins. They have died in their sins, but only Jesus died for our sins. And in fact, 1 John 2, 2 says, for the sins of the whole world. And in order to die for our sins, in order to represent us all before God the Father as the atoning sacrifice for our sins, Jesus had to be sinless, the perfect sacrifice, the spotless Lamb of God. No one else in all of the history of the human race has met that qualification. Only Jesus, the perfect God, man. And what happened next and what Peter said next removes all doubt that only Jesus, in fact, was and is the sinless Son of God. Only Jesus died for our sins, he says, and then only Jesus rose from the dead. Verse 10, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Now there are a lot of legends of history. Things like uh, George Washington cutting down the cherry tree. Or the Loch Ness Monster. How many of you believe in the Loch Ness Monster? I don't really need to know. So there are a lot of legends of history, but then there are events of history that have been witnessed by many people. January 2009, an American Airlines took uh, uh, airlines flight took off from LaGuardia, just a few miles away from us here, and landed in the Hudson River. And contrary to the outcome that we might have expected, everyone on board that plane survived. Now, how do we know that that wasn't just a legend, but that it really happened? Well, the answer is, of course, there were many eyewitnesses. There were people on that plane who experienced it, and people nearby who actually saw it happen, some of whom helped with the rescuing of passengers and crew. And many others of us saw it on videotape, on the news. So how do we know that Jesus really rose from the dead and that it's not just a legend of history? Well, like that plane landing on the Hudson River, Jesus' resurrection had many eyewitnesses who saw the crucified Jesus alive, even touched Him and watched Him eat. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul lists many of those eyewitnesses. Verse 5, he talks about Cephas or Peter and, and says that, that Jesus appeared to him and then to the twelve. So those closest to Jesus who were not expecting the resurrection saw the living Jesus. Verse 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time saw the resurrected Jesus, most of whom, Paul says, are still living. Now, it's hard for 500 people at one time to see some sort of mirage or false vision. And, and, and Paul says, hey, they're still alive just in case you want to go talk to them. And then he mentions James, this being James, the brother of Jesus, who had not believed until he saw Jesus alive from the dead. He then became not only a believer, but a leader in the Jerusalem church. And finally, Paul speaks of himself when he says, At last, uh, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Like James, 
Saul, Paul, had not been a believer in Jesus, thought the resurrection was a hoax. In fact, he had been the most ardent of unbelievers and had persecuted those who believed until the resurrected Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And then he believed and his life was changed. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is way more than a hoax or a legend. It is one of the best attested uh, events of the history uh, of history with hundreds of eyewitnesses, including some who would have never believed without seeing, without touching. Like Peter, we can declare with confidence, Jesus Christ rose from the dead and He is alive. And since He is alive, that validates the crucifixion. That Jesus' death on the cross really did provide the means for our sins to be forgiven. It validates all of His claims that He really is the Son of God, God the Son and Lord. And it validates this claim that only Jesus is the way of salvation. As, as you no doubt have done, I have visited the graves of a couple of famous people. I've stood by the grave of Abraham Lincoln. I've stood by the grave of Martin Luther King Jr. One can visit the graves of religious founders and leaders. You can visit the grave of Confucius in Jinning, China. You can visit Kushinagar, India. Probably pronounced it wrong. Where the remains of Buddha were distributed. You can visit the grave of Muhammad at the Green Dome in Medina, Saudi Arabia. And the decayed bodies of these famous people, of these religious founders, are still there. But we only visit the empty tomb of Jesus. He rose from the dead. And He is alive. Amen. And since Jesus is alive, the only one in human history to rise from the dead, never to die again, therefore, He is the unique and only Savior. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given to mankind by which we must be saved. Since only Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead, then no one can gain salvation through their own works. If anyone could have gained salvation through their own works, if just one person had been able to gain salvation through their own works, Jesus would not have had to come and die. But none of us did. In spite of that, however, this is the philosophy behind every other religion. Every other religion says we must attain it for ourselves by our own good works. Other religions say, I have to do it. Only Christianity says... It has already been done for me through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. No one can gain it through our own works. And no one can gain it through some other religion. While Christianity declares a resurrected Savior, well-attested fact of history, no other religion dares even claim that their founder is alive from the dead. And how could anyone possibly expect to gain life and salvation through someone who is dead and buried? Since He alone rose from the dead, never to die again, then everyone must come to salvation through Jesus Christ. His name is the only name. He is the only way. Here's the rub about Christianity in our culture and world today. This belief and declaration that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. We believe in the exclusivity of Jesus Christ in the face of a culture that holds inclusivity in highest power. If we said only that Jesus is our personal way, that He is one of many ways, no one would have much to say about that. They might simply say, hey, if it's good for you, have at it. They might think that we're nuts to believe it, but they're fine as long as we're not pressing it onto them. You 
See, the problem our culture has with what Jesus said in John 14, 6 is the word the instead of the word a. Uh. The problem our culture has with Acts 4, 12 is in the phrase of no one else, no other name, in the word must. Jesus Christ, you see, is not an option. He is a necessity. He is not one of many ways to salvation and eternal life. He is the only way. This isn't a personal issue for some of us. This is a universal issue for all of us. It's a human race-wide issue because we are all universally sinners. And Jesus, by virtue of His death and resurrection, is the only way of forgiveness and salvation. And because of that, we are compelled to tell people about Jesus and call them to salvation in Him. Yes, our loved one or neighbor who seems like a good person but doesn't know Jesus. Our loved one or neighbor who embraces another religion, but doesn't know Jesus. Our loved one or neighbor who thinks that many roads lead to heaven, but they do not believe in Jesus. Our loved one or neighbor who believes there is no God, and they don't know Jesus. And not just our neighbor, but those in Mongolia, who our brother just spoke of, or China, or Korea, or Europe, or Africa, who believe whatever they believe, but they don't know Jesus. Our message is of an exclusive way to God, an exclusive Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ. And that exclusivity makes us as followers of Jesus Christ vulnerable to criticism, to accusation and even to persecution. But we must have the courage of Peter and John filled with the Holy Spirit as it says, we must proclaim Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation even in a world that doesn't like to hear that message. While Jesus being the only Savior is central to these verses, Peter has more to say about the uniqueness of Jesus here that's important to us. Second thing I want you to see tonight is that Jesus is the only foundation stone. Verse 11. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become what? The cornerstone. The cornerstone in ancient times. In our days, cornerstone is just kind of a decorative thing, right? But in ancient times, it was the main stone placed at the corner of of the building. It was a large and solid stone, the foundation of the foundation, so to speak. The cornerstone underlies everything and holds up everything. And Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. He's building his church and he's the foundation upon which the church is built. In contrast to that, if we try to build the church on ourselves, we will fail. The church is not a human creation nor a human endeavor. Therefore, the church cannot be built on human intelligence. Here in Acts chapter 4, we have a Jewish we have Jewish religious leaders who were well schooled in the law and the prophets, interrogating men who were, verse 13, unschooled. They were fishermen who had little or no formal education. They were very well aware that they were dependent on Jesus. That they did not have innately what it took to fulfill His mission or build His church. The church of our day holds education up as a high value. As though it is necessary for effective ministry. It's interesting that our Alliance founder, Dr. A.B. Simpson, worked in this very city with what? With an army of irregulars. The blue-collar, the uneducated, the ordinary folks. 
He didn't really start an academic institution as much as a practical ministry training center where ordinary people could be trained for ministry. The truth is that much errant doctrine has been espoused by the highly educated. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying tonight that education is a bad thing. What I am saying is we can see it as too important and become too dependent on it. It isn't a bad thing, but it is not a trustworthy foundation under the church. That role belongs only to Jesus. In like manner, the church cannot be built on human personalities or resources. These Jewish religious leaders got it right when they observed that Peter and John were, verse 13, ordinary men. I'd love to have a photo of this little scene here in, in Acts 4. Uh, the members of the Sanhedrin no doubt, they, no doubt ornately dressed in their religious regalia while Peter and John were wearing their normal blue-collar street garb. But these ordinary men spoke truth with passion in this setting. And along with their ordinary colleagues were used by Jesus to change the world. Frankly, the church of our day is too caught up in human personalities, in evangelical superstars. And we've watched in recent years as many of them have fallen. But too easily, we can get caught up in that same personality cult mindset that overstates our importance as pastors and leaders when the attention isn't supposed to be on, on us at all. The attention is supposed to be on Jesus. And honestly, we've also become quite dependent on our own resources. Our skills, our money, our technology, our books, our plans, our programs. And Peter and John had none of that. But only depended on Jesus. They had healed a man in Jesus' name and made sure everyone knew that it was about Jesus. Not about them. It was Jesus' name that they were proclaiming before there's these religious leaders. There's a story about Thomas Aquinas walking in on Pope Innocent II while the Pope was counting a large sum of money. You see, Thomas, the Pope said, the church can no longer say silver and gold have I none. And Thomas Aquinas responded, True, Holy Father, but neither can she now say arise and walk. Like that Pope, often because of the human resources we do have, we forfeit the power that comes only through Jesus Christ. And depending on you. Our resources, all of them, whatever they are, are a faulty foundation that will fail to hold the church up. Our, our self-centered, self-produced efforts will always falter. But if we allow Jesus to build the church on Himself, He will prevail. Though rejected by many down through the ages, Jesus is still, verse 11, the cornerstone. He, he, as He declared in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. His declaration is true regardless of our spiritual opponent. Satan wants us to believe that his power is greater he works to intimidate us with his lies. He works to snuff out the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want to declare tonight on the basis of God's word, on the basis of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that the power of Jesus is greater than the power of Satan. Recently heard the story again of the growth of the church in China. 1949, when the communists took over China, there were 800,000 believers in Christ. 
And, and sought, Satan sought to use that communist government as his tool to snuff out Christianity in the most populous nation in the world. The next 30 years, as you'll remember, was the period of the Cultural Revolution that included the persecution and imprisonment and no doubt death of many of Christ's followers in that country. But by 1979, 30, not, 30 years later, the church in China had grown from 800,000 believers to 80 million believers. It had grown a hundredfold in the face of our spiritual opponent, Satan, when the church is built on Jesus, it will always flourish. And that is true regardless of our cultural environment. The trends in the culture of this nation, and indeed in many nations of this world, are unfavorable to the church. The church in the United States no longer has favored status with the government or the culture. Largely, we're seen as part of the problem, not part of the solution. And again, because of our belief in the exclusivity of, of Jesus as the only Savior, as the only way to God, the only way to heaven, we are mocked and opposed. And in response to that, I see too many believers in our country wringing their hands and living in fear. And to do so has to be based on the assumption that the success or failure of the church rests on our own ability and authority, which is not the case at all. The church belongs to Jesus. He bought it. And He sustains it. And He will not allow it to be snuffed out by the secular trends of our culture. Jesus is the firm foundation of the church. He will not fail. And His church will not fail. And when our focus is where it should be, on Jesus, we will not live in fear, but we will live, verse 13, in courage. The same courage that marked the lives of Peter and John even when they were being held in custody by those who opposed them and, and seemed way more powerful than them. We must always keep our focus on Jesus. The picture I love most, coming out of the tragedy of the fire in the Notre Dame in Paris a week ago today, the picture I love most was the picture the next day that showed in the midst of all of the destruction and, and debris, the cross still there and shining. You see, whatever happens in this world, Jesus will prevail and His church will stand. Final thing I want you to see is that Jesus is our only source. Only Jesus' presence with us provides what we need to stand for and serve Him. There's an interesting phrase in verse 13. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. And I'm quite certain that these Jewish religious leaders were not necessarily seeing this as a positive thing. They were associating these two men with one they had opposed, one they had accused of blasphemy, one they had crucified. But there's more truth behind their statement, I think, than what they even realized. Jesus had been physically with these men and they with Him. He had spent three and a half years with them, taught them, trained them, promised them what they now had. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. This gift Jesus had given them in the person of the Holy Spirit was the source of all they needed. And while we've never had Jesus physically present among us, he abides with us through His Holy Spirit. We too are people who have been with Jesus. Just as the Spirit dwelled with Peter and John, He dwells with and in us. Their source of courage is our source of courage. Their source of words to speak in challenging and intimidating moments is our source of words. Jesus has given us all we need to live for and effectively serve Him through the indwelling presence and fullness of His Holy Spirit. Again, remember the context. This all started because Peter and John stopped at the beautiful gate to engage a man who had been lame from birth in a conversation. Think about thousands 
of religious people who walked by this lame man day after day, some ignoring him, some throwing a dollar or two into his basket, but no one really stopping to engage him. You see, only Jesus gives us the love to stop and engage hurting people. This act, Acts 3, act of kindness, as it's called in chapter 4, verse 9, clearly had as its source the one who had spent, uh, that these men had spent three and a half years with. It, it, it all traces back to Jesus. They had seen him love hurting people. They had seen him touch lepers and make them clean. They had seen him open blind eyes and, and release new tongues. They had seen Him heal lame people so that they walked away. They had seen Him weep at the tomb of Lazarus and, and, and then bring Him back to life. Because they had been with Jesus, because the Spirit of Jesus now indwelled and even filled them, they knew not to walk by or toss a dollar or two in the basket. They knew to stop, to love, to care, to engage to touch, to help. When Jesus is our source, when His Spirit is at work within us, bearing fruit that is the character of Jesus, we will not walk by or shy away from hurting people. We will stop, we will love, we will care, we will pray prayers of faith. In Jesus' name, we will help the hurting. Only Jesus gives us the love. And only Jesus gives us the authority and power to help hurting people. How did Peter and John heal this man who had been lame from birth so that he walked and jumped and praised God? Well, they refer to that question in chapter 4, verse 9. We are being asked how he was healed. And they were clear and forthright with the answer. Verse 10, it is by the what name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that this man stands before you. This wasn't human authority or human power at work or the man would have still been lame. This was the power and authority of Jesus Christ that he has what delegated to his followers. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 tells us that we have the same power at work in and through us that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now that doesn't give us carte blanche permission or ability to use that authority and power anytime we want in any way we want. But when the Spirit prompts us, we ought to stop in that situation, step into it, and trust Jesus to exercise his supernatural power in a way that helps hurting people and gains the attention of all kinds of people so that we have the opportunity to credibly declare the gospel to them. I've described the trends of our culture to you and how they view us as followers of Jesus Christ. Our mere human ability will not cut it in this culture. We need to be conduits of the supernatural power of Jesus Christ through the working of His Holy Spirit who fills us. Jesus is the only source of the authority and power that it takes to convince our skeptical, sometimes even cynical world. A couple of years ago, I met a young Vietnamese Alliance pastor named Qua. Qua was a part of a Christian family when he came to the U.S., but he was clinging to his traditional Buddhist religion. I don't have time to tell you his story uh, totally tonight, but along the way, his grandmother, whom he loved dearly, was told that she was going blind. And Qua sought out a fellow student on his secular college campus who he knew to be a believer in Jesus Christ and asked him to pray for his grandmother to be healed. Now, what Qua meant was for the friend to go home and pray later. But that friend boldly stopped right there in the middle of that secular college campus and prayed with Qua listening, prayed boldly for this grandmother to be healed. And against everything the doctors had been saying, she regained her sight. Jesus healed her. And this was a key factor to Qua leaving behind his Buddhist faith and putting his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 
so that today not only is he a follower of Christ, he's serving the Lord as a pastor and reaching a diverse group of young adults in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. You see, that's the kind of thing that only Jesus can do. He's the only Savior. He, he, he's wooing people to Himself. He's the only foundation stone who will pre preserve His church and allow it to thrive against any opposition and in any environment. And He's our only source of authority and power. Enable us, enabling us to step into situations filled with the Spirit, not with fear, but with confident faith to say to hurting people, and there are many hurting people in our world, to say to hurting people, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. There is no other name like that name. The name of Jesus Christ. May He be praised. God bless you. Susan, this is... The tune back up, Susan. 네, 좀 우리 한번 찬양하고 기도하고 이제 축, 축도하고 마치기를 원하는데요. 아, 이번에 기도할 때 우리가 저기 동부 지역에서 이번 총회를 위해서 준비 기도 모임을 가졌었습니다. 그래서 이 자리가 오순절 망할 나라 땅이 되게 하여 주시옵소서 그런 기도를 많이 했습니다. 우리가 내년 오늘 총회가 아니고 정말 다시 한번더 우리 시대적인 성령을 감당할 수 있는 우리 목사님들, 선교사님들, 상인님들 다 축복합니다. 그래서 기도하실 때 교단 우리 지도자 대신 우리 자스턴버 우리 총재 님치도 우려를 주시고 오늘 말씀 잘해 우리 테리스미스 부총재님 또 교단 내에 있는 모든 선교사님들 특별히 우리 한의총회 우리 한의총회 속에 있는 모든 교회들이 서로 하나 되게 하시고 다시 한번더 주님의 영광을 위하여 모든 교회들이 다시 일어나게 하여 주시옵소서 그래서 각 교회마다 성령의 바람이 불게 하여 주시옵소서 우리가 이 기도 제목을 가지고 찬양 위에 우리 같이 통성을 기도하겠습니다 오늘 말씀을 기억하시고 우리 다 같이 한번 일어나셔서 함께 찬양하겠습니다 
거룩하시고 존귀하신 주님 우리에게 너무너무도 거룩하시고 귀한 선교의 사명 주신 것을 감사합니다 특별히 네. 선교 제일 우선순위를 갖고 있는 우리 세대의 교단에 우리를 보내주신 것을 감사합니다 네. 하나님 이 밤에 주의 사랑하는 선교를 사랑하고 선교를 살고자 하는 종들의 부르짖은 기도를 들어주시고 우리로 하여 우리 교회로 하여 우리 가정으로 하여 오직 선교를 위하여 남은 세월을 살아갈 수 있도록 축복하여 주시옵소서 주님의 임재가 가까워집니다 세상은 말세를 입하여 다름질하고 있습니다 하나님 이제는 주님 오시는 길밖에 소망이 없는 때입니다 하나님이 이를 위해 우리 교단이 우리 교회가 우리 성도가 깨어서 기도하고 열심으로 선교에 헌신하는 우리들 되게 하여 주시도 없어서 이제는 하늘의 영광을 보이시고 선교사로 이 땅에 오셔서 우리의 생명을 구원하시기 위해서 자신의 생명을 죽게 내주시 그리하여 우리를 하여 선교 사명자들 하여 삶과 사회의 원리를 깨닫게 하시고 본을 보여주신 우리 예수 그리스도의 무한하신 은혜와 엘리엘리 나와 서었더니 나의 하나님 나의 하나님 어찌하여 나를 보셨나 사랑하는 독생 성자의 이 부르짖 도에 의견하시고 오직 우리를 구원하시겠다는 그 한마음 가지시고 종래는 사랑을 자신의 목숨과 같은 사랑하는 독생자 성자를 우리를 구속하시기 위해서 제물로 십자가에 내어주신 아버지 하나님의 그 거룩하신 사랑하심과 사랑하는 성자의 은혜와 사랑하는 아버지의 사랑을 깨닫도록 우리 안에서 우리를 가르치시고 교통하시고 성령의 역사시 이 밤에 주님 앞에 다시 한번 결심하고 타지만은 여기 모인 우리 모두 외워 이 성교의 사명을 최우선순위를 가지고 충성을 다하는 세련의 교단과 사랑의 모든 이 성교를 세워주신 교회 외워 성교사님들 외워 우리 모두 외워 이로부터 영원토로 함께해 주시옵시기를 간절히 죽어나옵나이다 할렐루야 우리 하나님께 영광과 주님의 박수를 해드리겠습니다 우리 옆사람을 사랑하는 바에도 인사하시고 자리에 잠깐만 앉아주시면 감사하겠습니다